Hello, we are the Ministry of the Real Truth and we're striving and striving really hard to bring you what the original biblical manuscripts, the scriptures, were actually saying, what they actually mean through the translation work of George M. Lampser, a native-born Syrian Aramaic speaking translator through his works, his translation that he probably got from the Apostolic Church of the East, the Eastern Syriac Peshitta, he translated into nearest English equivalent. So let's begin at chapter 1, Genesis Introduction. Genesis is the first book of the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, a Greek translation of the Aramaic or biblical term Kam Sha Supre de Moshe five books of Moses. They are also called Torah, the law, or the books of the Lord Moses. Well, Moses, growing up in the Egyptian courts, would have learnt their religion, their customs, their writings, their language, etc., and be influenced by them, and they'll be embedded in his club's conscious of it. So when he's liberated with the house of Israel, goes into the desert, then maybe God gives them these other laws, it's shortened down to ten Mosaic laws, and then you've got the Levitical laws, 613 of them. He may have had some influence influence from those Egyptian 42 laws of Ma'at, but not necessarily plagued them. There's a lot of Kemet Pan-Africans on the Sarnita live TV debates that say, oh, they stole them, they stole them, you know. We're using logic, common sense, reason, and reality. It's uh, uncanny how those mosaic laws are very similar to the Surapapak texts of Syria. Genesis is the Ara- Genesis in Aramaic is Berita, very close to Brita in the Tavesha, just a variation on the word. The creation, even though the primary objectives object, objective of the author of it is to give the Jews the history of their ancestors. He included in his work an account of the creation of heaven and earth and all that are therein. That was necessary in order to give the genealogies of the patriarchs and of Abraham, the father and founder of the Hebrew race, and to picture their ancestral and cultural background in their language and religion. The author traces Abraham's ancestry back to Adam and to the divine promises which God made to Eve. Genesis 3.15 Evidently, some of the portions of the book of Genesis were handed down orally or verbally. Others were written during the time of Moses. No, Moses did not write it. It's been attributed to him. Okay. Jews admit, well, we have to give names to these texts. Someone's got to put a name to it. It's our custom. It's our tradition. So that's why we do it. We know, we admit that Moses possibly didn't write these. Somebody else did but we just attribute it to him because we need to because it's our custom it's our tradition eventually some of the portions of the book of Genesis were handed down orally or verbally others were written during the time of Moses the whole work was guided by divine revelation and God's inspiration the author's aim was not to explain God's creation from a scientific point of view but to give his people an idea that the Lord God of Israel was the creator of the heavens and the earth and that the pagan gods could not create and therefore were false gods created by men. There are two accounts of the creations in the book of Genesis. The first is the spiritual account. God acted as a God, creating everything by his command. The second is an explanation or a commentary on the first. For many centuries, the two accounts of the creation and other sacred materials were handed down on separate scrolls or tablets, and only after many years were they combined into a single work. Moreover, some of these accounts were written by different scribes. Marginal notes were often incorporated into the text and copied by later scribes. For example, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended, Psalm 72.20. This note was written to facilitate the reading of the book, The Burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amoz, did see, Isaiah 13.1. The Burden of Moab, Isaiah 15.1. The Burden of Damascus, Isaiah 17.1. And many other such instances are scribal notes, which were copied into the book. Eternity. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1 1, 1. This should read, God created the heavens and the earth in the very beginning. Because he was that beginning. It's so actually talking about the manifestation of God. The Muta, i.e. the Son of God. Because in the Tav Asher Brita, or Genesis in English, it's translated there as, in the beginning, Eastern thought is, what it's hinting at is, as that beginning, for the Son of God was that beginning, created the heavens and the earth. The motor, the manifestation, that which was not revealed, but then he was revealed, God incarnate, God in the flesh, dwelt amongst his own people. His disciples spent three and three years with him, etc., etc. And he told them all about what God said in the gospel and the good news of grace, mercy, salvation, etc. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. Genesis 1 1. This should read, God created the heavens and the earth in the very beginning. God is the subject of the sentence, and the heavens and the earth are objects. The author states that the heavens and the earth were created from the very beginning. That is, before the sun and the moon and the stars were created. In other words, the heavens and the earth were created before time. There was no time, only infinite space. No time as we know it. God alone can reveal to man how and when the heavens and the earth were created. Some scientists place the age of the earth as 4 billion years. Humanly speaking, 4 billion years are eternity. Many aspects of the creation will remain a secret which man will never be able to unlock or reveal. Neither Jesus Christ nor the Hebrew prophets try to explain the mystery of the creation, but they believe that God created them and that God can destroy them if he wishes. Well, you have a look at the Taf Asherit, Brita, 1 verse 1 and onwards, or Genesis 1 1. Onwards, you will find that it actually is explained by one word or through one word called Yuma, Y U M A, which means immeasurable period or unfathomable period. No man, no human being was created, so they couldn't write it down when God started, when God finished. That's why it's immeasurable, unfathomable period. God took his time, he could have taken a millennium, it's completely up to him. Yeah. And it also means Eon Age Era or Day with capital D. It's a funny kind of day, not as we know it, day of the week, right? Because it's uh, to do with the lunar solar cycle and its evolutions or revolutions, the cycles, right? That they went through. Essence without form. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Genesis 1 2. The earth may have suffered some catastrophic disturbances as the result of inner stresses, such as volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. The surface of the moon reveals such marks of volcanic disturbances. Be that as it may, seemingly the earth was devoid of the forces and equilibrium which makes order and life possible. The first order might have been overthrown just as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, Aramaic Amora, in the days of Abraham. Moreover, the formless matter may have been in existence ages before order and life appeared upon the face of the earth. The creation of the firmament, the sun, moon and stars made order and time and life possible. In other words, we may conclude that at the outset, the earth was not capable of producing life, and it lacked precision and harmony. Behold, the Lord shall destroy the earth. Or take note, the Lord shall destroy the earth and lay it waste and turn it upside down and scatter its inhabitants. Isaiah 24.1 I beheld, or I looked, or I saw the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens and they had no light. Jeremiah 4.23